Thank you. It's great to be here. I'm obviously excited to be a part of the Core Institute and excited and thankful to have everybody here tonight watching. So we're going to talk about a topic that I'm very passionate about and I can speak passionately about it because I have this and have been treated for it. So everything you should know about chronic venous insufficiency or chronic venous disease. So some important statistics about venous insufficiency or CVI. It affects all age groups. So it's not just the old, it's not just the young. It's 10 times more prevalent than PAD or peripheral arterial disease. The direct cost of CVI in the US is estimated to be between 150 million and a billion dollars per year. Of all hospital admi admissions of 100,000, approximately 92 are because of venous insufficiency. That's from things like chronic venous ulcers or um, cellulitis. At least 20,556 patients a year receive a diagnosis of venous ulcers. So not just venous insufficiency, but actually venous ulcers, the most severe manifestation of venous insufficiency. More than 30 million Americans suffer from varicose veins or a more serious form, CVI. Of the 30 million Americans affected, only 1.9 million seek treatment annually. In a lot of cases, that's because people just don't know they have it or that venous insufficiency even exists. What are the risk factors? Older age, family history, DVT or deep vein thrombosis, a history of phlebitis or an inflammation of the superficial veins or the shallow veins, obesity, standing occupation, pregnancy or female gender. The majority of what we see are actually patients with a family history, uh, standing occupation or pregnancy. Some other possible risk factors include smoking, high blood pressure, oral contraceptive, physical activity, and constipation. Constipation seems like an odd one, but that can be from um, what's called Valsalva maneuver, um, which can raise venous pressure and affect the function of the valves. Let's talk a little bit about the venous anatomy. This will give you a better understanding of how we form our treatment plans for patients. So the superficial venous system, again, that's the, the shallow veins or the veins that run in the skin versus the deep venous system that are surrounded by muscle. The great saphenous vein or GSV is the longest vein in the body. Often runs superficial and subcutaneous from mid thigh to the knee. It runs in what's called the saphenous sheath, which we can see by ultrasound and you'll see in a second. And it's closely associated with the saphenous nerve below the mid calf, which will be important later on in the discussion. In a lot of cases, it's duplicated. So you can imagine that if you had two great saphenous veins, you'd have to have them both treated, not just one. So this runs from the, the great saphenous vein, and, and that's an ultrasound picture there, it runs from the dorsum of the foot to the medial malleolus to the common femoral vein, which is in the groin. It's usually within the saphenous sheath, as we described. Accessory saphenous vein, or great, uh, excuse me, accessory veins of the great saphenous vein. So usually we have a, a vein called the anterior accessory saphenous vein, which runs along the middle, and we say anterior or front part of the thigh. Begins posterior to the lateral malleolus in the ankle. Travels up the calf between the two heads of the gastrocnemius or the calf muscle, and may have a thigh extension up into the thigh. That's the SSV. There's the AASV. We talked about that as well. That's the at just an accessory or duplicated great saphenous vein. The perforator veins are important. We often see in severe manifestations of chronic venous insufficiency that if you develop a wound, the perforator vein that's not functioning properly runs underneath the wound. Here's a, just an explanation for the size when they're pathologic. If it's greater than three and a half millimeters, if there's greater than half a second of reflux, it's usually located under that wound, like we said. So what's the pathophysiology? We talked about the anatomy. So, so how does this actually happen? Well, in, an, in a normally functioning lower extremity, the calf muscles end up being very important for the delivery of blood back towards the heart. So we know that the arteries carry blood down the legs. They carry oxygenated blood to oxygenate the muscles and the supporting structures in the lower extremities. But the blood has to get back to the heart. And how does it do it? Well, it does it through this muscle pump. So every time you take a, a step, 
the calf, the calf muscles contract, and they empty 40 to 60% of their volume with a single muscle contraction. Primary venous reflux can occur in any superficial or deep vein of the lower extremity. The saphenous veins that we talked about in their branches are often involved in, in patients who have prominent varicose veins or symptoms of venous insufficiency. So we know that the deep venous system carries blood using muscle pump, but the superficial veins that run in the skin don't have the benefit of being surrounded by the muscles, and therefore they, they don't have the benefit of muscle pump to re return blood back up towards the heart. In addition to that, the blood being returned from the lower extremities has to fight against gravity to get the blood back. So the superficial veins are heavily reliant on the valves, and the valves act kind of like the stairs on a ladder. So every time the heart beats, the blood travels up towards the head, and as the blood gets pulled back by gravity, the valve closes. And with every heartbeat, the blood works its way up the leg. Well, if the, vein, or the valves within the veins stop functioning correctly, you develop reflux, or that blood traveling in the wrong direction, pooling down in your lower extremities. So we classify patients when they come in to see us using the seat classification system. So you can see that C0 is normal, C1 is patients who have tele telangiectasias or reticular veins or spider veins. A C2 patient would be a patient who has actual varicose veins. A C3 patient has swelling in their leg. C4 are patients who have skin color changes or eczema around their ankles. C5 is a healed venous ulcer and C6 is a patient who has an active wound. So these are just the corresponding images you can see. C1 is a patient who's got these spider and reticular veins. C2, the varicose veins. C3, you see the patient's left leg is asymmetrically swollen. C4, you see those skin color changes around the ankle in both A and B. C5 is a healed venous wound. And C6 is that active venous ulcer. And you typically see that not in the foot, but around the ankle and lower leg. So what do we do when we see a patient that we suspect has venous insufficiency? Well, we do a, a general health assessment. We ask questions about past medical history, symptoms, do a physical exam. You know, in my mind, when I see a patient, I'm trying to first and foremost delineate whether the patient has arterial disease and venous disease. And patients who have arterial disease will typically describe that they're active and when they, when they become active, they have cramping in their gluteal muscles or in their thighs or in their calves. And when they rest, that discomfort goes away. Venous patients, on the other hand, describe their symptoms at any time, rest, with movement. It's usually at the end of the day. Some patients will say that they're sleeping and they're woke, awoken at night because of restless legs. They obviously describe swelling. Some patients who have visible varicose veins will have tenderness so that when they, when they bump their leg, they complain of pain in that region. A little less typically, I'll have patients that really have a hard time describing their symptoms in their feet and ankles and will say that they have this feeling of creepy crawlies on their feet and ankles or discomfort on the bottom of their foot. I actually, as I said earlier, have venous insufficiency and have been partially treated. And my symptoms are really primarily in my ankle and in the bottom of my foot. And I, I experienced a lot of aching and for a lot of long time I thought I had plantar fasciitis. So after we've done a, a patient assessment and physical exam, you move on to the ultrasound. And the ultrasound's done to do two things. It's to, actually three. It's to make sure you don't have a, a blood clot in the deep venous system. It's to check the size of the superficial veins. And we also measure the direction of flow. So remember we said that the arteries carry the blood down towards the feet. The veins carry the blood back towards the heart. So we can actually check the direction of flow. So if the flow is in the wrong direction down to the feet within the superficial veins, we know that's abnormal. So what are our treatment options? Well, obviously we, we approach first using conservative therapy. So, you know, just general exercise and activity. At the end of the day, you can use leg elevation. We recommend all patients wear compression stockings. And in severe cases, some patients will wear Una boots. Uh, and I'm sure everyone has seen patients wearing those boots in the grocery store or the pharmacy. Surgery is an option. Surgical stripping is really far less commonly performed now and really doesn't have the same outcomes or, or reliable side effects as our other less invasive therapies. 
thermal ablation using either radio frequency or laser, which is one of the treatment mo modalities I use, non-thermal, non-tumescent treatment, which includes foam sclerotherapy or mechanical chemical treatment. Foam sclerotherapy is really just the injection of a, of a medication that causes the blood vessel to close. And then non-thermal, non-tumescent, non-sclerosis, non-sclerosin cyanoacrylate adhesive, which is just a glue that we use, a, a, a biological glue. So surgical stripping, the term high ligation and division implies ligation, which is closing or stitching closed, a division of the great saphenous vein as, at its confluence with the common femoral vein. And that's in your groin where that happens. The term stripping means removal of a long segment of vein, usually of the saphenous veins, using it, a long instrument that actually removes the vein. That was done really commonly years ago. It was associated with admissions to the hospital uh, and, and typically patients wound up having worse swelling than they started out with. It was performed for greater than 100 years, usually requires general anesthesia and the recovery time is really long. This is just a, a study that was done, or multiple studies that were done comparing radio frequency ablation and surgical stripping and you can see that, you know, on the lower boxes, the pain and bruising, recovery time, return to work, procedure time, complications, and quality of life are all much better with radiofrequency ablation versus surgical stripping. So we're going to switch now to thermal ablation. Again, like I said, I don't perform laser. I perform radiofrequency ablation. Um, so basically, you know, there's a, a catheter that we insert into the vein. There's a seven centimeter active element on the tip of the catheter or tube that heats up. Um, this requires using a local anesthetic the entire duration of the vein because obviously this thing is heating up over way over 100 degrees and you would feel that. And we don't want you to feel that because you won't like me if you feel it. So we want you to be comfortable and it to be a reasonable procedure and it, it really is that. Um, the catheter is inserted and then we numb up the vein and then push a button and the catheter, the tip of the catheter heats up and as we pull it out, it basically welds the vein shut. This just talks about the occlusion or closure rates through five years. So you can see, you know, a little over a year, the closure rate is 97% closure and out to a, after four to five years, it's around 90% closure. So patients will ask me often, you know, is this gonna stay open or is this gonna stay closed forever? Am I gonna have to have it done again? And the answer is, you know, in greater than 90% of the cases at five years, you're not gonna have to have it done. But sometimes some patients do have to have it done. Sometimes their body opens the vein up or um, you create these other pathways. That's the other thing that can happen. It's not just that the vein opens back up. Sometimes other pathways open or other veins that were not normal at the initial time of treatment become abnormal and we have to treat them. So pretty good closure rates overall over a long period of time. Low complication rate. I, you know, the complications, just, just a sh brief overview. The thing that we, we get most concerned about when we do any of our treatment modalities is that patients could develop a, a, a DBT or a blood clot. It's really uncommon, less than half a percent of the time, and usually there's not a lot you have to do. Infrequently, I have to put patients on a blood thinner for uh, about 30 days, and usually they're taken off of it. It's usually of very little significance. This is just a, a study that was done comparing surgical stripping, uh, laser, radio frequency, and ultrasound guided foam sclerotherapy. In the past, foam sclerotherapy was the primary treatment modality for the large truncal veins, the, the saphenous veins. They would inject this foam to, to close the vein, and it, and it worked, but it's, it just doesn't work as effectively as, as our, uh, our other modalities that we, we now use really frequently, frequently. So this study just showed that, you know, at one year, 95% of the time, using RF ablation, the vein remained closed, which was comparable actually to vein stripping, but that's because the vein is removed. Um, Post-intervention post pain was the best in radiofrequency ablation. Time to return to normal activities was one day. I actually, I had my procedure done on a Tuesday night and I was back at work Wednesday morning. Time to resume work, 2.9 days. And then, it, you know, obviously the cost overall is much cheaper to our system with these less invasive and actually more efficacious modalities. So is there a better option than these thermal modalities or is there a, you know, something that's pretty comparable? 
And I think actually the, the, the thermal modalities work really, really well, and that's actually what I had. But sometimes we have to use something else. So venocele is our non-tumescent, non-thermal, non-sclerosant modality. So our current treatments, we talked about, you know, surgery. We don't want surgery. It's long recovery. It's, you know, higher complication rate, generally anesthesia. You know, the thermal modalities, you know, when we do radiofrequency ablation, you can get hyperpigmentation. It's uncommon, but it's possible. When I had mine done, I had a lot of bruising. It all resolved. You can have scarring. That's not really a, a, a significant thing. Um, you know, the incision that we use is very small. Um, and for an old guy like me, I didn't really care about a, a tiny little incision. Um, endothermal heat-induced thrombosis, that's just that blood clot associated with the procedure, really uncommon. A hematoma can, can develop, it's un uncommon, but a small collection of blood under the skin can occur. Thrombophlebitis is just that inflammation of the vein that we treat. That, that does happen, uh, where people will say, you know, I, I have this ropey feeling in my leg where you did the procedure. Well, that's your vein. It's just, it's clotted off and it's, it's scarring down and it's tender to touch it in the short term. Nerve injury is possible. It's, it's certainly possible. Some patients, and in most cases, patients will say, well, you know, I have this, this spot on my leg where uh, this patch where you treated me, I, you know, I have some, some tingling there, or I, I've, I've kind of, I've paresthesias or lost sensation there. In most cases, that gets better. It's certainly possible that, you know, if you had atypical anatomy and a nerve traveled right beside where we were treating, that you could damage the nerve uh, in a minor way. When we do that tumescent or when we inject, and I may not have explained this well, but tumescent is the injection of lidocaine mixed with saline. We inject that around the vein, and that's to do a few things. That's to numb it up. It's to kind of contribute to the compression of the vein while we're, while we're heating it up but it's also to push structures away that we don't want to injure, so it's possible. And whenever we, we use one of these thermal ablation modalities, we make you wear compression stockings afterwards. So by using venocele, what does that mean? Well, we don't have to use this to mess any anesthesia. You know, patients will say, well, I don't, I don't want you sticking a needle in, me, in my leg four or five times to numb up the entire vein. Some people, you know, I, I had it done, it, you know, it didn't bother me, I didn't find it to be painful at all, but some people have a lower pain threshold and don't really like needles and would prefer you weren't sticking a bunch of needles in their legs. Um, Post-procedure post compression stockings, you know, I actually think you probably should wear these, but in some case, if you told me, you, you know, I just don't want to wear them and I can't wear them and most people say that, then, you know, you probably could get away with it. And post-procedure pain and bruising, you just don't have that with venous seal because we're not heating up some catheter inside your leg and we're not sticking a a needle in your leg and trying to numb up the whole vein. You don't have to because we're just injecting glue. So why not use cyanoacrylate? Well, it's been used for so many years. They use it. This is just a picture of an MRI where they've treated a, a vascular malformation in the brain using cyanoacrylate or glue. This is just a, a chart showing all the different medical uses of glue. Um, Ethicon is a surgical adhesive that's used. Truefill is a, is a glue that I actually use in the hospital. I'm doing more complex procedures. Um, and then cyanoacrylate and dermabond used for wounds and skin incisions. So it's pretty safe to use. Uh, it has an antimicrobial effect against gram-positive organisms, which is great because obviously we don't want to inject this stuff into your vein and you know, have it get infected because that's a whole other problem. We don't want that, that to be a problem at all and it has no reported carcinogenicity, or it doesn't cause cancer, so that's great. So it's ideal because it's viscous, it's thick, it polymerizes or hardens quickly, it's soft, maintains a strong bond. So whenever the cyanoacrylate or glue touches the blood, it polymerizes and hardens quickly. It can at times trigger an inflammatory reaction that's above and beyond just, a, just occluding or blocking the vein. So some patients will say, you know, doc, I, you know, my leg is really, really tender and I'm having this pain and it's, it's actually a few days after the procedure and I have this redness. And they deny fever or chills, they don't have any of the signs of an infection, and it's really just a hypersensitivity reaction and we give patients a, a, stero a, a um, steroid dose pack and uh, usually it gets much better. They may have a little bit of swelling as a result of the glue, but but that goes away. These, that's, this is really, really uncommon for the number of patients we treat. It's less than 1% of the time this happens. 
That's just a look at the gun that we use. That's how it's a delivery system that that injects the glue in a controlled fashion so that you can't accidentally inject too much at a time or shoot it into spots you don't want it to go. Um, like we said, no need for tumescent anesthesia, so we're not injecting all that tumescent or lidocaine around that vein. You're not in, in, and actually that ends up resulting in a lot of post-procedure swelling when we inject all that tumescent. So pa patients think it's an abnormal thing. It's just we've injected a bunch of fluid into your leg and you have a lot of swelling as a result of it. We talked about the compression stockings already, and you get to return to normal activities pretty quickly. And remember, we also said there's, there's almost no bruising when we do Venusil. I just want to like, give you a little idea of what it's like on a procedure day, because I have plenty of patients that will say, um, are you going to put me to sleep when you do this? And I think people should know that, that conscious sedation or any type of sedation does not come without risk. And this just isn't a procedure that requires conscious sedation. We do it using this local anesthetic. And I talk to the patients the whole time. I, we talk about their day. We talk about my day, if they, if they want to hear about it. Um, talk about <laughs> what's for dinner. <laughs> but it's, it's a, the point is, it's a relaxed environment. It's not something to be afraid of. And I think it's OK to be afraid of the unknown. But it really is a really, really tolerable thing. And you know, some patients, you know, we're not treating all of your veins in one session because we're not allowed to. But some patients have four or five veins that need to be treated. So, you know, you get the first one done and realize it's not a big deal. And when you come back to have the other ones treated, it's, you know, obviously patients have much less anxiety about the procedure as time goes on. So, so I, I put together a couple cases of actually my patients that I've seen over the years. Um, and we're just going to talk about a couple different things. We'll talk about um, really briefly just severe venous insufficiency. So you kind of have an understanding of what can happen because you know, I'm, I'm actually guilty of this as well, but a lot of patients think that, that vein treatments are just cosmetic, and it's not true. It's, it's actually a real disease, and, and I had 10, 12 years ago, I had a, a, a rep from one of the companies come to me and say, hey, we'd really like you to do this, and I said, you know, I, I don't want to get into this cosmetic stuff. It's just not my thing. I don't want to do it, and he said, you know, this is not cosmetic. This is a real thing, and interestingly, soon after, I was diagnosed with it, so this is a real thing. People experience it. And because it is kind of indolent, I think people just learn to live with it. And, you know, it can become a much more severe thing and people can, can have a more active life as a result of having it treated. So talk about the first case. This was a patient of mine, 56-year-old guy with chronic varicose veins and leg swelling. He actually was a, was a truck driver. He had multiple hospitalizations for cellulitis of his legs. No one could really understand or explain why he was getting it, but he kept on getting cellulitis, these skin infections. He rec recently bumped his shin, uh, and the wound just wouldn't heal. He wrapped the wound, and, but didn't seek additional treatment, and wasn't recommended by his primary doctor to see anyone. Then after that, it got worse, and then he, they finally sent him to a wound clinic, but there was never an explanation for the cause of the wound. You know, they did you know, various treatments on the wound by debriding it and putting you know, different dressings on it. It just never got better. So he finally ended up coming to me. So this is what the wound looked like. When he came to see me, you know, obviously you can look at this and it looks terrible. He's got this skin discoloration, the skin's dry around it, but he's also got this wound. So obviously he's at huge risk of de developing cellulitis or an abscess or worst case scenario, if he doesn't do anything about it, he can get an infection in his bone, which is, you know, a bad thing. Obviously if something like this gets infected, um, depending on the bug, it, you know, we may not have antibiotics that treat it effectively and it may it move up other places that you don't want it to go. So he got an ultrasound and he had reflux or that, that misdirected flow that was pooling down his legs. So we ended up treating him with radio frequency ablation and he came back to see me in one month and that's what it looked like afterwards. His leg felt better, you know, the, the wound was almost completely cleared up. You can actually see his skin around the wound looks much better. It's dry. And he was feeling great. He's feeling much better. And that's just a comparison of what it looked like. That's one month. You know, not everybody develops this. It's hard to predict who's going to develop it. Um, but, but this was one month. This was how much better the guy looked. So deep venous disease, we talked about you. Primarily, we've talked about superficial venous disease. But sometimes, you know, not, you know, not every patient fits into the, the same box. And sometimes you can develop deep venous disease. And, you know, these are patients that have you know, in the past they've had blood clots or sometimes the veins in their pelvis are being compressed by, by 
the aorta or they get compressed by the spine and you know different supporting structures in that area can compress the vein and as a result the the veins in the legs just don't drain properly we typically diagnose it using venography that's just injecting dye x-ray dye and following the dye uh, under x-ray guidance and you know in specific cases we use something called intravascular ultrasound which is just a catheter that has an ultrasound probe on the end of it and we're actually taking the picture from the inside out rather than the reverse. You know, IVC filter placement can certainly contribute to this. Recently, I had a patient in the hospital who came in with, with leg swelling, really, really severe leg swelling, and we did a, a CAT scan on him, and he had complete blockage of his inferior vena cava from the filter all the way down his legs, and I had to go in and suck all the clots out and stent him and, and pull the filter out as well. Um, deep venous disease is typically uh, underdiagnosed. This is just a look at um, that's actually my hand in there. That was a, an, a filter that was in a patient that I had to go in and take out, and I had to use some pretty aggressive measures to get it out. And you can see there's a little bit of, there actually like is skin growing on the end of the filter, uh, and it was really, really hard for me to get out. It was not easy, but you can imagine if, if these filters can grow this skin or film over top of them, they're going to inhibit blood flow, and eventually when the blood stops, it just clots off. So. Having a filter and, and being on a blood thinner, you know, every patient is different and, and, you know, I take every case, case by case, but it's not a normal thing to have a, a foreign body inside you that's um, not really serving a purpose. Uh, this is case two. This is, a, this is an incredible case. This was a patient that I saw a couple years ago when I first moved to Phoenix. Um, it was one of my first days at the hospital. He was a 36-year-old male who had been admitted to the hospital multiple times and he had severe leg swelling. He really, really obviously is a young guy. He likes to play sports, but no longer can play them because his legs were so heavy and he had so much swelling and so much pain. He was, it was torturing him. So he gets admitted to the hospital because he's in pain really more than anything. This was a picture of his legs. Remember, this is a 36 year old guy who is not overweight. This is what his legs looked like. So, we decide, I decided to do a, a, a venogram on him. So I went in through the veins in the back, back behind his knees and injected dye and then also came from above and took a picture. And this picture will make a lot more sense uh, once you see another image, but basically has no direct straight flow in his inferior vena cava. And remember the inferior vena cava is a, the largest vein in your body and there was no normal flow. This is He's got all these little tangles of veins all over the place because his body's tried to bypass this blockage. This is another picture. Right in the middle, that's his spine. So we're looking at right around his spine, overlooking his abdomen. I injected again and basically nothing was going through. It should be, the, the, that black dye should be traveling up towards the top of the screen, but it wasn't. So I spent about two days trying to open this guy back up and his, his his inferior vena cava was completely blocked. His pelvic veins were completely blocked. And I, I spent hours on this guy getting him back open because it was, you know, it's worth it for all of you, for all the patients, it's worth it. Um, and this is what it looked like afterwards. I went in, I, I sucked large volumes of clot out of his veins um, and I stented him and now he's wide open. And so here's just a comparison of what that looks like. Obviously the image on the left is that abnormal image where there's basically no flow overlying the spine. He's just got all these twists of veins where there's wherever the body can get the blood back towards the heart, it's doing it. Versus the image on the right where the, the stents are wide open, there's inline flow towards the top of the screen where the, where the heart is. Um, so he, uh, he improved quite a bit. This was literally the next day. That's what his legs looked like. Um, you can see he still has some skin discoloration, but his legs are normal. That's the comparison. This is literally days apart, these two images. Um, so he got much, much better and he was a young guy and stayed active. And that's really the key for all of us to stay alive is, is to be active and keep moving and don't slow down and, and uh, you know, to, to be able to live a, a really full and active life, so. Well, I hope this was interesting and helpful and, and um, I just am so thankful that you all were willing to log in and, and watch and you know, I hope if you're having a problem, I hope you don't have a problem, but I hope if you do, you come see us and, and, and we can figure it out. So with that, I think we're probably going to take some questions.
I, I wish I could say that patients get to choose completely which treatment modality they get to use, whether it's, whether it's primarily whether it's venous seal or whether it's radiofrequency. Um, it's really dependent on insurance, but insurance d does cover the procedure. Obviously, everybody's copay and deductible is different, but insurance does cover it. So it's a good question. Um, I think most of it, any of the conservative therapies are Band-Aids. So I don't think they're gonna get better, but you can at least manage your symptoms. They're not gonna go away though without some form of treatment. That's actually a, a good question. I think, I think this is an important thing too. I tell my patients this all the time. In most cases, as long as you don't have a wound, it's not an emergency, okay? So no one has to feel like, you know, because there is a, there is a, there are steps that we follow. We like patients to be treated conservatively first. We don't want to, we don't want to just do procedures on every patient that comes to it. We don't want to just, it's not, we're not going to do procedures on patients who don't need it. We do procedures on patients who need it and on patients whose quality of life we can improve. We usually start by having patients have a, a conservative therapy, whether it's six weeks or three months with compression stockings. And then at that point, if it's, if they're not getting better, if, if their quality of life is not getting better, then we can treat you. So I, I never want patients worried, and, and uh, I see it sometimes that if you have to work that, wait that six months, six weeks to three months to get treated, it's not an emergency. Um, and in some cases, patients will say, I don't wanna wait, I cannot wait, I wanna get treated, this is really affecting me. And then we take the steps that we have to take to contract to con contact insurance to get it treated. Um, it's not an emergency, everybody's different, but in most cases, you know, we can confidently and in a really controlled manner get you set up to be treated effectively. That's a great question. So, and, and I, again, this is, this, is, this is where the conservative part of it comes in. So I do have some of these patients that come in and they just say, this doesn't bother me at all. It doesn't bother me one bit. And I say to those patients then, you can wait. It's not an emergency as long as you don't have actual skin changes. And if you have skin changes, you'll know it because the pigment of your skin will become darker around your ankles. I think at that point, um, you're, you're starting to get in the territory of having significant venous hypertension and that if you bumped that leg, you would have a hard time healing that wound. So if you got to that point, I think that's a, that's a time to start getting treatment. Um, even if you're not having pain, I probably would recommend, if you were a family member of mine, I would say you probably should have your veins treated despite the fact that you're not really symptomatic. But um, otherwise, I, I, I try not to, you know, if it's not broke, I, I try not to fix it because I, I understand as a proceduralist, you know, you can have good intentions and things can go wrong. Um, and there are, there are side effects to everything that's done. So I wanna make sure that if I'm treating a patient, I'm treating a patient that I can make their life better. That's what's important. Lymphedema. Yeah, so um, that's a great question. Lymphedema is really, really, a, it's, it's a really tough disease to have. But usually the treatments for lymphedema are uh, compression. Uh, and now there are really interesting devices, uh, uh, intermittent pneumatic compression devices that patients wear that, that actually see a pretty significant improvement. We have a relationship with a company in town that provides uh, intermittent pneumatic compression as well. So. That works too. If someone feels like their legs are heavy, like logs, when should they seek the treatment? That's a great question. Um, that's, that's one of the signs of venous insufficiency. In fact, I found out or realized that I had venous insufficiency because I was running on a treadmill and my legs were heavy and I was having a hard time. And, and um, decided to get an ultrasound and that's how I discovered it. So you certainly could have the symptoms of venous insufficiency. So an ultrasound would be helpful in diagnosing whether or not you have that. Uh, 
Yeah, you know, heat has a tendency to make your veins dilate or get bigger. And um, I can imagine that when that happens, you know, that the, um, small perforations or microscopic holes that are in the sides of the veins because they can, they can leak, any blood vessel can leak, the fluid component of blood, those just get bigger and you get swelling a lot more. I think it's probably a couple things too. Patients tend to be a lot more active and outside when it's warmer, so um, that probably contributes to it. But certainly I've had patients that have told me that, you know, once it gets warm, my veins get way worse. <laughs>